Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, page 1153 of the Church Bibles. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbour. 
eat whatever is sold in a meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which I give thanks? So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offence to Jews or to Greeks or to the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. I suggested over the last two or three weeks that 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 expose us to some of the most profoundly challenging and complex decisions that you and I are ever going to have to make as Christians in our workplaces, in our schools, public institutions, in our families, amongst our loved ones. And today, as a church, some profoundly challenging decisions. We're going to examine another church seeking to live out their Christian faith in a pagan culture, and I hope we shall learn some lessons from their mistakes. I want us to see first that their presumption put them in acute peril. That is, they proudly assumed, because of what they knew, that they'd be all right, even as they put themselves in grave danger. Their presumption placed them in acute peril. Like like somebody facing an exam who says, well, I'm not going to do any revision at all. I'm sure I'll be all right. Sorry to mention that for those of you who are in those shoes, but, you know, that's a, a foolish thing to do. I know from experience. Chapter 9 ends and chapter 10 begins with the strongest possible warning. The end of chapter 9, Paul cites himself and his lack of presumption, showing that he continues to strive for a future goal of final salvation, even though he's been saved by God and is assured of his salvation. So chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. For every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable, so I do not run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul believed in the perseverance of the saints, and of course, the Apostle Paul believed that the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, knows his sheep, and no one will snatch them from his hand. But this knowledge did not prevent the Apostle Paul from continuing to run the race with utmost energy and deliberate personal discipline. You might say he doesn't allow his assurance of salvation to dampen his striving for salvation. He realizes he's not there yet. There's a finishing line. He hasn't crossed it yet. And of course, with the language of these verses, Paul is speaking in picture language. Some people have used these verses most unhelpfully to encourage actual physical discipline of the body, but that's not the point. Rather, like the athlete, Paul sees himself in training, and like the athlete in training, Paul does not consider himself yet to have completed the race. And so he doesn't allow his freedoms, as it were, to cause him to be presumptuous. He strives. (laughs) Remember seeing the documentary of the Olympic gold medalist Catherine Granger. She was a rower. It was six o'clock in the morning. It was February. You could see her breath on the window of the car. And the person making the documentary, what on earth makes you do this? As she sat outside Datchet Reservoir waiting for the rowing lake to open, and she said, the podium. 
Though Paul believes that nothing can separate us from the love of God if we trust Jesus, and though Paul is persuaded that those whom God has predestined, he's also called, and those whom God called, he's also justified, and those whom he's justified, he's always glorified, you're absolutely safe. Nonetheless, he disciplines himself and he keeps his mortal flesh under control lest he find himself disqualified. This is most important, especially to us Christians who are free, living in an age that worships the goddess Marianne, liberty. We must not develop a doctrine of salvation that morphs into presumption. And that is precisely what Paul is concerned with over the Corinthian engagement with meals in idol shrines. We're safe, they say. We're at all protected. Nothing can touch us, they say. Not so fast, says the apostle. Chapter 10 sees Paul move from his own example to urgent exhortation from the example of others. And these Corinthians knowers, so puffed up with their knowledge, such confidence in what they know, need a little more education. <laughs> he takes us back to the salvation history of Israel, and it would seem that they've missed a whole section of the history syllabus. He takes us to the Old Testament and to the example of Israel in the desert following the Exodus. And you might have thought that those who were brought out of Egypt would have so impressed upon themselves God's saving power that they would cling to God no matter what. And verses 1 to 14 suggest otherwise. They are studded with the strongest possible warnings. Twice, Paul says, these things happened as examples for us, these things from history. And so we need to take care that we're not presumptuous like they were. Verses 1 to 6 they had the most exalted spiritual experience. Look at verses one through six. Imagine yourself there. I mean, it was an extraordinary period. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, chapter 10, verse one, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. These things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. So they passed through the Red Sea. I mean, can you picture yourself being there that night as they were led first by the cloud and then by the pillar of fire? And as the waters of the Red Sea banked up on either side and they crossed on dry land, and then the waters closed in over Pharaoh. I mean, it, it's an extraordinary supernatural event that you can never forget. And then they were provided in the desert with manna from heaven, food descended upon them and quail. And then on more than one occasion, out of the rock, supernaturally, as if he were kind of following them, as it were, or going before them, God provided water from the rock. So powerful was it that actually Israel ended up calling God our rock, the rock of our salvation. Read Deuteronomy 32. And, and that's why Paul is able to say it's as if Lord Jesus himself was there with them in the desert. And yet in spite of these extraordinary privileges, which you imagine guarantee the unwavering devotion to God and absolute determination not to miss out on crossing the finishing line, getting into the promised land, nonetheless they rebelled against God, their presumption, their peril. Now verses 7 to 11 provide just a handful of very carefully picked examples of rebellion. Verse 7 is very striking. No sooner was Moses' back turned than they begged Aaron to make an idol out of gold and they bowed down to worship the calf. Don't be idolaters as some of them were, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Then as is always the case with idolatry, their worship of the golden calf came hand in hand with sexual immorality. Verse 8, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. Any culture that turns from the one true creator God always rapidly descends into the sexual stone age. 
Just look at the last 50 years. But then verses 9 and 10, no sooner did they encounter hardship than they grumbled against God and tested God, not believing that he would provide from them, for them and taking things into their own hands. Verse 9, we must not put God to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as an example they're written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So tightly constructed, isn't it? Paul's example, I strive. Don't be presumptuous. Just because you've been baptized doesn't mean you make it to the end. And then examples, carefully chosen. Full of strong negatives. Do not, we must not, we must not, nor should we. And if you cast your mind back to the Exodus event, from start to finish, there were extraordinary acts of kindness and mercy and salvation by God met again and again and again with Israelite presumption. You read it. They assumed they'd be all right. They presumed nothing could touch them. They took God and salvation for granted, and thousands fell Numerous were destroyed. The angel of God's judgment, which had actually destroyed the Egyptians, came and moved amongst them. But then quite beautifully, in verses 12 through 13, having given the strongest possible warning, Paul now gives an assurance. Therefore, lest anyone think, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, that is not common to man. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, a lot of people take that verse and say, oh, that's all right, and go down to the pub, drink 15 pints, and God will provide a way out of it. You know, no, no, that's not the point. No, the point is that even as you face the hostility, social Uh, deprivation, exclusion from standing with the living God in a culture and its idolatrous practice, as you stand apart, oh, God, God will provide for you. Any resulting hardship that comes to the Corinthians as they step apart from idolatrous practice will be met by God's faithfulness. And there will be no trauma that God's power will not enable you to endure. And verse 14 is so warm, isn't it? I just love verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, and yet it's urgent, flee from idolatry. Uh, You know when you go to stay in a house with your small kids and there's an open fire, you know, it's... There's always one of the kids, you know, they want to get in there with a stick and all the rest of it. And do do you say, oh, see how close you can get to it without getting burnt? No, you don't. And you know when you first take the family on the tube, you know, there's that that yellow line or perhaps a visitor from overseas. Oh, the point is to see how close you can get to the edge when the train's coming. No, 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 you say stay behind the yellow line. And you know when you're on the beach in the storm, you know, and it's, it's raging, and you say, whoa, whoa, stay back here. And uh, when you're on the cliff and, and somebody wants to go and stand right close to the edge, you say, oh, no, 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 no. It's almost impossible to overemphasize the place of idolatry in first century Gentile territory, which is where Corinth was. I mentioned before that there were 17 different gods worshipped in Corinth, with multiple shrines. Idolatry governed absolutely everything. You passed your exams, ah, then you made a sacrifice to the idols and your family had a feast. You you go up to university, oh, you've got to to sacrifice to the idol, make sure whatever the idol education was, you get along all right. You you graduate from university, everybody comes up, you have this idolatrous feast, a sacrifice is made, and you all give thanks to the idol. You get married, you get a job, you do a deal, you die. You know, the, the idol temples were the restaurants and pubs and the Mercato Metropolitan, I'm trying to say that show just how trendy I am, of 
the first century. And of course, every culture stems from human rebellion against God. Language comes from Babylon. All culture is shot through with sin. Every culture has its emblems, badges, markers, and flags. And the idol stood, if you like, at the intersection between the idolatrous, wicked belief, sinful belief, and practice. And so the pressure to conform and to compromise and to kind of join the hail fellow well-met conviviality of Corinthian culture, why it was intense. You step apart from idolatry and eating at the idol temple or even going to a feast where your friend actually sacrifices to the idol, you step apart from that, you are going to be socially cut off. They'll think you're an idiot. Hostility. Listen to this writer. Anyone desisting from public sacrificial events was unfit for political functions. To rebuff the invitation of friends, neighbors, patrons, not only would cause one's social status to plummet, it would mark you off as odd and repugnant. <laughs> Can you imagine being the guest at a home of somebody else? The event begins with an offering of food and a sacrifice to the idol. Imagine being part of a club, maybe one of the city livery companies, you know, all this sort of stuff. Grace is a prayer to that idol. A toast is made to that idol. The goddess Marianne, liberty, fraternity, equality, we're free people, unregulated rights for all, and so forth. Can you imagine if that person who invited you was your boss or your father? Can you see the offense? There's an ancient Greek text uh, called Joseph and Asenath. It dates from between 200 BC and 200 AD, and it pulls together a whole series of ancient writings, and you can find a transcription of it in Syriac in the British Library. I haven't studied it in either language, I hasten to add. But there's a point at which Asenath reflects on the impact of having stood apart from the idolatry of her family. Listen to what she says. Save me, O God, deserted as I am, for my father and mother denied me because I destroyed and shattered their gods. You feel the cost of that? So how easy in that context for the Corinthians to allow their knowledge that idols are nothing to enable them to eat food in the idol shrines. And, and, and Paul is saying, look, don't do it. Don't do it for the sake of your brother or sister who doesn't have the kind of knowledge you've got. They'll get sucked in. But don't do it because of your own presumption. Just, just remember the history books. Go back and do module two, will you? God detests idolatry. You're in grave, grave danger. Now, throughout this series, I've tried to find equivalents for us as Christians in 21st London. I'm sure you can do much better than me on this. But you know, every culture stems from human rebellion against God. Every culture comes out of Babylon, ultimately. Every culture, sinful as it is, has its emblems, its badges, its markers, its flags. And in our own culture, we have our flags and ceremonies, badges and markers, which epitomize the intersection between the kind of deeply held, passionately held views and life. I sought to give equivalents. I mean, the Christian convert from a Muslim family who has to officiate as the oldest son in a funeral ceremony for an elderly relative. You can see the kind of difficulties. Last Sunday, there was a principal of an African Bible seminary here. We had a long conversation about traditional African religions where the eldest boy has to preside at all sorts of things which are related to ancestor and the, the well-being of the whole family. And you're going to, and you're a Christian, flee from it. We've talked with our Asian brothers and sisters here about tomb sweeping ceremonies. I remember very well going to Hong Kong in 1979 and seeing the veneration of ancestors. You step apart from that, the cost. 
But what about the rainbow flag? What about the Church of England, the readiness of churches, so-called Christian men and women, to participate at the temple shrine of LGBTQI+. As I've meditated on, I think this is probably the closest for us as a church, for many churches like ours. Always seems to me deeply ironic that having won hard-fought freedom in the Second War, and having prayed for that freedom to the Creator God, our culture, just like the Israelites in the desert, turned immediately to worship at the Temple of Liberty. And rejecting God as creator, this idolatry, as with all idolatry, unregulated rights, I'm free, has multiplied sexual immorality. And I know the flag means nothing like any kind of idol. It means nothing. It's just a flag. It's a rainbow. I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, it reminds you of the NHS. (laughs) Or hopefully it reminds you of Noah (laughs) and the flood and God's grace and goodness. And I know it's just an emblem, but it is an emblem. And as an emblem, a profoundly anti-Christian idolatry emblem that works itself out in sexual immorality, as idolatry always does. The Stone Age. What then if your boss demands that you wear it, or your school insists that you wear the t-shirt? What if the suggestion is made that by not wearing the lanyard or the t-shirt, or withdrawing your child from the R&S education, which you're perfectly entitled to do on certain instances, you are considered not to be an ally. In fact, you're an enemy, you're an opponent, an intolerant bigot. You're with Asenath. Why not simply not make a fuss? (laughs) Go with the flow, not rock the boat. Apostle Paul says, your presumption is putting you in serious peril. Have you not done your history? Now he pushes it further because he then moves on to say that their attendance is provoking God's anger And I I love the way he puts verse 15, I speak as to sensible people. He's trying to, my beloved, sensible people. And then he uses our understanding of the Lord's Supper, the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? There's one bread, we who are many are one body. We all partake in one bread. He uses our understanding of the Lord's Supper. This is not his complete doctrine of the Lord's Supper. He's saying, look, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we take the bread, we drink the wine, we go back in our mind's eye by faith and we join with Christ on the cross. And therefore, because we're joined with Christ on the cross, we're joined with one another. So we're part of this new, this new family. And so verse 18, consider the people of Israel, are not those who eat the sacrifice participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, though idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Do you want to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Do you think you can take him on in a fight? Paul's aim then is to get these Corinthians right out of the idol temple. And his point is that by participating in these meals with the sacrifices, as those who are joined to Jesus, they are, as it were, joining themselves to demons. And God is jealous. And quite rightly, as any husband with his wife or any father with his daughter, he's jealous over his bride. Of course, idols aren't anything. They're just bits of wood. There are spiritual forces at work. By embracing the emblem, you're embracing the spiritual force. And you're risking God's anger, incurring God's anger. Now, I can't see a closer parallel for us 
than the way in which Bible-believing churches should relate to the Church of England as it drifts further and further into idolatry. As the established church, led by bishops without courage of biblical conviction, cowers under the coattails of an idolatrous pagan establishment, so the established church seeks to retain its position in society, fearful that God won't provide a way out, if only they will stand. Meekly surrendering to the pagan idolatry of our age, which worships the goddess Marianne, with its heterosexual and homosexual immorality, the leaders of the Church of England quietly give ground. One of the most shocking experiences of my whole Christian life was to be in Nairobi with vast numbers of African bishops and archbishops who had risked their lives and were remembering the death of one or two of their members as martyrs, and hearing video testimony from an archbishop in the West, that they sound it so frightening to stand up to the culture of our age, and therefore they think they should keep quiet. When the rainbow flag was flown over Manchester Cathedral, the bishop wrote, that by hosting the pride flag, once again, we commit ourselves again to continue to campaign for the full inclusion of LGBTQI plus in the church. When the rainbow flag was flown over Ely Cathedral, the Bishop of Ely similarly defended it. When a Lord's Supper in celebration of pride took place in the Diocese of Oxford, the event took place with the full backing of the suffragan bishop. When various churches stood and taught on sexual purity, the College of Bishops, in Oxford wrote against them. The Apostle Paul is arguing here that as we participate in the idolatry of our age, not only do we put ourselves in grave danger, but we provoke the Lord to jealousy. Are you going to be linked with them? Are you going to get, attend prayers with them? Are you going to get ordained alongside them? Oh, but the flag means nothing. We're into inclusion. Surely we preserve our position in the established church and we, we keep our platform for preaching the gospel. So, so that's all fine. Oh, but what if God's actually angry with it? Which explains why here as a church, and there will be other churches like ours, we've made it very clear that we won't participate in prayers or communion services or spiritual activity. We will be in broken partnership. And I hope you can see this isn't simply a matter of the way William Taylor sees it. It's fundamental to our age. Well, very briefly, verse 23 through to chapter 11, verse 1. Their presumption places them in peril, yes. Their participation provokes God's anger, yes. But their freedom, yeah, you, the freedom shouldn't leave you kind of uninvolved. Just look at it. We'll cover it very briefly. But all things are lawful, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, not all things being built up. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience, not your conscience, but his. So why should my liberty be determined by somebody else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Do you see, hearing this kind of warning could leave Christians saying, Whoop, retreat, put up the walls, get right out of all society. Now, most of the meat that was offered in idol temples then got sold in the market 
it was virtually impossible to buy any kind of meat without it having, in one way or another, been offered to, to, to an idol. And so you could well imagine somebody say, well, that's the case, and we better all become vegans, can you imagine? <laughs> some of you are rejoicing at that, some of you are shaking your heads. And Paul says, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. Don't get engaged in the act, but be free when it comes to the meat, unless, of course, somebody sees it as a real problem. So when I was a soldier, we used to go running with the, the, the lads down in Winchester, where we were stationed down there. There was a village, I can't think for the life of me where it was now, it was near, near Winchester. And uh, it was like there was a huge exclusion zone around the village. You, you had to take a huge detour, the path went right through, but you weren't allowed to run through. The post boxes were on the outside of the village. It was some kind of exclusive Christian sect. You've read chapter eight and nine, the first after chapter 10, whoa, stay away, don't shop at Tesco's. Don't even let the postman or woman, the post person, into your village. They had to have their post boxes outside the village, lest they be made unclean. And Paul says, no, 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 go on shopping at Tesco's. Go to dinner parties. Don't withdraw. Think. And the key to your thought that governs everything is there in verse 31, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, like I said at the start, back in chapter eight, I think these raise some of the most difficult, challenging, complex decisions you and I ever have to make as Christians. They involve dear family members, practices. They involve workplace practice, how we're gonna behave at work. They're very complex and challenging issues. And they warrant a lot of thought and careful prayer together and advice from others. And I'm so glad that we got a question time. And I hope I can be helpful in that. Um, William, just starting off, someone says, what, can you just go through again? What makes something an idol here? Why is LGBTQ plus an idol? Yeah, I mean, Paul is arguing all the way through that the... Um, the idol is nothing, it's just a piece of wood. And in week one, when we were looking at 1 Corinthians 8, we went back to Psalm 115. It's very clear, idols don't have mouths, they can't speak. Idols don't have ears, they can't hear, eyes and so forth. They can't see, they're just dumb, they're bits of wood. And uh, the thing that, so an idol is nothing, it's just a piece of wood, but it's what lies behind it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, and um, he says it's actually there are such things as demons and powers, and there are, you know, there, there are anti-Christian philosophies that are, you know, of the evil one, and you can see them wrecking whole cultures. And what makes us think that just because one particular anti-Christian idolatry, uh, demonic philosophy might wreck a whole culture in Eastern Europe, we shouldn't have our own, and we do. Every culture has behind it influences and so forth. And they tend to find then their expression in a visible marker. And that's what I've, I've called it. So the idol was just a piece of wood, but there was behind it lying a whole hinterland of belief and anti-God anti philosophy. Thank you. Um, what's Paul's logic between the proximity and the participation with the idol and then the judgment, the jealousy of God. Yeah, I think what he's saying is that when you go to, I mean, as a Christian community, we have God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling within us. Um, as a result of the death of the Lord Jesus, we've been washed clean. God now lives within us. We join together to hear the word of God, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're united with Christ. And this picks up on chapter six and seven. We're, we're, we're one with him. Same sort of idea back there. In the demon, um, in the idolatrous feast, it was understood that at this point of sacrifice, the, the, the power of God that was, as it were, behind the ceremony became present as host of that feast. And therefore, as you ate, well, you are now being united and welcomed into the fellowship of that God, or sometimes several gods, because everybody liked to hedge their bets. And so they would have several gods represented at a feast. And so how can you take your own body, which is a temple of the Holy Spirit, language coming out of chapter six, and unite it now with 
a, 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 an idol, which itself is nothing, but has behind it this demonic philosophy um, that is everywhere in the world, in all cultures. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a few questions here around the danger and kind of the parallels between what we saw through the Red Sea in Israel mm. and today, and just how dangerous is it, really? What, what's the, um, the danger that we'd put ourselves Well, in? I think it is presumption. I think... You know, if you come from a more, a more, and some will, from a more kind of Catholic background, you might say, well, I've been baptized, so I'm safe. It really doesn't matter what I do. I'm going to be safe. I can go out there and the silly illustration of, you know, drink 15 pints and I'll, you know, it'll be, but I can, I can do what I like because I've been baptized. And you see that, don't you? It's a very lax attitude to, actually, no, I belong to Christ. I need to make it across the, the finishing line. There's a race to be run. There's discipline to be endured in the Christian life. Um, but we could equally, the Corinthians, well, I'm free, they say. We've got this knowledge which seems to be kind of divorced from practice. Because we've got this knowledge and have these ecstatic experiences when we come together in our meetings, then what we do out there doesn't really matter because we're, we're secure, and so we can do what we like, and so eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So that kind of presumption, I think, which you saw with the Israelites. You know, they thought they'd put God to the test. They'd assume he'd be with them come what may. He might, you know, no way God's going to get um, uh, disciplined towards us uh, it, because, because we're his and we went through the Red Sea and so all will be fine and, and crack on and enjoy a bit of idolatry on the side. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. You know, that's a highly perilous position to be in. And not only is it perilous, but there's the anger of God to consider if you unite yourself with an idol. Thank you. Um, lots of people with helpful questions trying to think this through. And someone's saying, well, can you just clarify what we are and aren't saying when it comes to LGBT? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not participating with the, the emblem, but Paul is keen that all people are saved. Just in yeah. terms of well, I do not it. have simple answers. I, mean, I think that my job is to take the teaching of Scripture, lay it before us, and then our work begins. I want to begin by saying, look, I do not have simple answers. And as I said last week, I think in the first week, I sounded much too kind of as if this is all very straightforward. And I know it isn't. It's incredibly complex. I mean, what if it's one of one's children? Or, um, you know, how exactly are we going to, to, to engage in this? Um, I mean, there are aspects, you know, I think the way that in the 20th, uh, mid, early, mid 20th century, the way that people who are tempted in the area of same-sex sexual attraction, the way they were treated was appalling. I mean, appalling. Uh, and I want to say that openly and plainly. But to embrace the culture that I think comes out of worship of the goddess Liberty, to, to, to embrace that culture in terms of sexual promiscuity, which our culture has done, no. And where it's then, if, if you like, sanctified and enshrined in a particular movement, then I'm going to be extraordinarily careful. I'm certainly never going to, I'm, I'm longing for the day, this is typical, I'm afraid of me, but I'm longing for the day when some sensible Christian makes a lanyard that is self-evidently, plainly Christian, and we should all wear them openly and, uh, and clearly. But you wouldn't, wouldn't dream of wearing the lanyard or putting that on your, on your email thing or whatever. And you know, I'm, I'm encouraging us then to ask questions about our de um, diversity and inclusion departments. Because of course we believe in diversity and of course we believe in inclusion. But those words, diversity and inclusion, are essentially meaningless until you load content into them. I mean, it's right on to say I believe in diversity, but what does it actually mean? Until you start putting some content into it, it's just a meaning tip. You shouldn't use that kind of word in that kind of way, because it's meaningless. And what is happening is it's being hijacked with people who've got a very, very clear agenda to force us into a totalitarian way of thinking about particular issues, DNI. That's how it's being used. And they've been very clever because they've taken words that sound good, mean nothing, loaded their meaning into it, and ex uh, are aiming to exclude it. Not everybody's doing that, but you need to think about your own DNI department. Ask some searching questions. 
Um, I'm going to wear a Christian lanyard that makes it very clear that I'm Christian in Pride Week and all the other Christians are going to do exactly the same. Are you diverse? Oh, it's meaningless. Yeah, you mean I can't bring myself to work? Do you see? So I think we've got to, and that's why I can't answer because every school is different. You know, I've read the government um, educational advice very carefully. I know what you can and can't do with your primary school children, your children up to 16, and your children over 17. I know what they can and can't do. But your school will operate differently to another school. So actually, you need to go and ask questions as to quite what you're letting your children be educated in. Um, and yes, it may well mean social exclusion. They'll talk about you and gossip about you on the touchline. And, says Paul, and... That's exactly what the Israelites faced. And it's what it means. Don't just be an awkward, difficult person for the sake of it. Um, but it's, this is really important stuff. And is it worth saying that this is, this is about our honoring of the Lord and seeking our concern for mm. salvation and concern for one another and not identifying with something that is Thank you. That's against a... the Lord? We still are within that. Always yeah. looking to love, to serve. To Thank you, on. Phil. Phil, it's so good. That's why we need to have discussions, because one can say something like that. It makes it sound like we're just being awkward for the sake of being awkward. No, we're trying to strengthen our dear Christian brothers and sisters in the school and a silent, significant number who, you know, just are going with the flow, not really thought about it, but we're trying to strengthen our... You know, we're doing it out of love for our Christian brothers and sisters, not just... And to honour the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Now, does that mean you'll never go to dinner with somebody who's living with his or her same-sex companion? Not at all, not at all. Um, you'll be there, you'll celebrate them as friends. Yeah, so, does that mean you'll never have to stay, you know, a heterosexual person who's living unmarried with their heterosexual partner? Not at all, not at all. So, do, do you see, those are the kind of issues where it gets... Difficult, because you're making decisions all the time. Thank you. Last question. We're gonna, we will be making lots of decisions, and you said in the talk this is something for us to be talking about, praying about, and our small groups and our friendships are really key places to be doing that. Uh, last question. Just um, remind us again that why is it worth counting the cost in these moments? Yeah, thank you very much, because there is a finishing line, <laughs> you know, and, and um, you know, there is being with the Lord Jesus for eternity. And uh, the resurrection, as we'll get to in chapter 15, really did happen. Christ did rise and therefore be steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord, for our labor in the Lord is not in vain. So it is, you know, it is the gospel, ultimately, um, that makes it gloriously worthwhile. There is a prize at the end. There is a podium. Fantastic. Thank you, William.